We're getting plants into the ground out here that I can't wait to share with you. More from the Garden Home next. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about garden design and blurring the lines between inside and out. Well, today's show is all about the glories of the garden. In the next half hour, what I'm going to do is share with you some design tips, some of my favorite varieties, and some ways that will make your gardening life easier in your garden home. So why don't we get started with what's going on right here. Over the years, I've created lots of gardens, and I look for ways to help save time and money in the design of the garden. And that's what I've done here with these raised beds. Now, when we first started laying these out, the guys doing it thought I was crazy because, well, as you can see, there's lots of geometric patterns here laid on the ground, but there's a reason for that because it helps to organize the space. You see, one of the things I learned a long time ago is that you've got to get the framework right. So with these geometric beds in place, when things come up and grow, and they will, they won't be a big blooming mess where everything grows together. You'll be able to sense the order in the place. As I said, these beds are laid out in different geometric formations. And there's a slight curve in this path, and the beds have to follow that. And this has meant a lot of trial and error for the carpenters as they build the beds and try to fit them into place. Of course, the good news for the carpenters helping me set up these raised beds is that we're just about finished. We're adding soil and beginning to do the planting. Now, before we get into some of the plants, there are three tips that I want you to keep in mind that we're employing out here. First, the beds themselves, next the soil, and finally, moisture. Now, I want to point out something to you. These beds are made of a rot-resistant timber. This is actually western red cedar. In other gardens, such as the Chicago Botanic Garden, I've seen raised beds that are higher and made of brick. This is ideal for those with limited mobility, such as a person with arthritis or who has difficulty bending or stooping, or a person in a wheelchair. Even being low like these, it gives me a place to sit on and it just makes the garden easier to manage because I can reach across them and weed like this. And since the soil is raised and insulated with these cedar boards, it stays warmer longer. As the winter comes to a close, the soil is warmed faster by the spring sunshine, which allows me to start some of my favorite spring veggies like broccoli and lettuce earlier. Okay, easier maintenance, longer growing season, two very good reasons for you to consider raised beds in your garden. All right, now let's talk about the soil. Whenever I work with soil that's heavy clay like this, I like to take one part existing soil, combine it with one part sand to one part humus. This recipe's worked well for me over the years, and that's what I'm doing here. Now, when it comes to humus, there are lots of different sources out there. You can use potting soil or even your own homemade compost. Now, a simple test to know whether you have the recipe right is to be able to reach into the moistened soil like this and get a handful and hold it, squeeze it just as hard as you can, and then open up your hand. If it falls apart, then you know you've got the right blend. Now, remember, I said moisture. Moisture is key here. Over the years, I've learned that consistent moisture is the key to success. Now, in a few shows back, I talked about the virtues of soaker hoses because we're using those out here to keep the soil moist. If you missed that, let me cover a few of those points. First, soaker hoses are different from a drip system because they weep or sweat moisture. Get types that are made from recycled rubber. It's just nice to know that that stuff's not in a landfill somewhere. And UV protection on rubber is important for a long-lasting soaker hose. And finally, lay the soaker hose on top of the ground and cover it with mulch. This does two things. It helps conserve this precious moisture in the ground around these little plants, and it helps hold the soaker hose in place. And it also helps protect the soaker hoses from the sun. Now, I'm not gonna mulch these beds yet, and there's an important reason why. I'll show you. So here we have the start of many of the plants that I'm growing in these raised beds. Small plants, seedlings coming up, and many of them are from seed. 
Now there's nothing wrong with starting a garden from seed. In fact, my first garden was full of seed. It was a stopgap measure early on to get lots of blooms before the shrubs and perennials came along. I planted cosmos and globe amaranth, zinnias, marigolds, and nicotiana, you know, the flowering tobacco. Now I want to show you something that's nothing short of a miracle in my opinion. You see all these little seedlings coming up here? It's one of my favorite annuals. It's a cosmos that's orange and it will bloom late in the season and will flower really till the first frost. Now what you can see here is that these little seedlings are all over the place. But the amazing thing is that they germinated in just four days. So obviously we had the conditions right. The soil was just moist enough and of course it's plenty warm out here on a summer day. Now the other approach we're taking to getting plants in these boxes is to use some of these little propagated cuttings. You see a lot of these in garden centers in the early spring, and I know they don't look like much, and it's easy to pass them up to go for the big bloomers, but if you're on a budget and you've got some patience, it's important to give these little guys a try because they'll sure perform for you if you get the conditions right. A few of the varieties that we're growing here in these boxes include petunias, like this one called supertunia. And this is a phlox that's really proved itself in my garden called Intensia. And this coleus, well, it's a must in my garden because of its lime green color and because it's called Granny Smith. You can't beat that. Now one thing about drilling a water well, usually there's no guarantees. What we'd recommend you do first of all is probably get with your state geological commission and take a plat with you of the property and have them review it. At that time, they can tell you what the chances of hitting water on that piece of property are. At that point, you've done your research. The next step will be to hire a well driller. And after you have your well drilled, you'll need to find someone to test the water for mineral content, for bacteria, and also you want to make sure that you get with the driller to know exactly what the production rate is on that water well. When testing water, there are several tests that need to be made. Number one would be the pH. We need to know what the pH is of the water. We need to know the calcium content or the hardness. We need to know the iron content as well as manganese, total dissolved solids. Here at the garden home and after drilling a couple of water wells, we've determined that there is a significant amount of iron content in these wells. And what has happened is it has actually stained the plants with a reddish brown color. And this not only detracts from the beauty of the plant, but it also will cause some health problems. To test the iron, we used a color test. By adding a specific chemical to the well water, we'll actually turn the water a specific color, illustrating a part per million level of iron content in the well. Now, there are several ways to eliminate this problem. Once we know the mineral content of the water, then it's just a matter of sizing a particular filtration system to take care of the specific problem. As an example, here at the garden home, we have removed the iron content through ion exchange. Another word for that is water softening. We've also precipitated some of the iron. We've added chemicals to actually turn the dissolved minerals into a solid, and then we're picking them up with a filter. Now, three good tips. Number one, be sure to get a good water test. Number two, Find a good company that represents you and someone that knows how to treat water. And number three, remember that all water treatment is not the same. Every system usually has to be custom designed. Welcome to the design studio. Now this is the part of the show where I love to take photographs that you send in to me and we play around with them to come up with some ideas that improve the exterior of your home. Now here, we have a beautiful little cottage, and I think that it's very charming, and we can do a few things that'll actually improve it. Now, what I like about it is that it's quite symmetrical. You've got windows here and here, with this pediment in the center, and you've got a very straightforward entryway coming up to the front like that. And you can see over here there's a tree that comes across which I think helps to frame the house. We'll get to that in just a moment because I'd like to balance that if we can. Now a few things I'd like to change would include here. I mean you can see the car is pulled up right over here to the edge. It seems like we need some stepping stones that might come across to this point. The other thing is that the flower bed is right against the edge here. So I want to consider 
maybe bumping the flowers back into a little private garden and make this a hedge across the front. So why don't we get started? We'll just erase these marks. Now I think that with a cottage like this, you really want to bump up the charm factor and there's no better way than to take the picket fence approach where here at this entryway we might actually do a post and I'm going to draw it over here. You'll just barely be able to see it because again the photograph cuts off at a certain point. If you just had a charming little gate right here, I think it would add so much. And then as I've mentioned, I'd like to see a set of just stepping stones. Maybe just three would be enough to be able to get across to the front step. Now, I think these window boxes are great, but they ought to be larger. If you've ever tried to plant in a window box that size, you know that they dry out so quickly. It's all about soil volume. The more soil you can have in the box, the less likely it's going to dry out and the more successful you'll be. Now, what I'd like to see in terms of greenscape is to bring this hedge all the way across the front and get really serious about it where it's clipped and comes right to the edge of the walk, just like this, you see? Almost the height, maybe even taller than this bank of shrubs they have at the foundation of the house, which look, to me, look like azaleas. So this could be a boxwood or yew hedge coming across like this. And then on the back side of it, it looks like they have daylilies here that are planted along this row. What I would like to do is see maybe those all planted in a flower border along the front of in this bed here as perennials, where we might add other cottage flowers such as phlox, purple cone flower, for instance, even black-eyed Susans, they'd be fantastic in the summer. And then if you wanted to add a, an annual, some parts of the country, Mexican sage is a perennial, but in most of the country, particularly in the northern areas, it's an annual. You could have that in here, which would be a beautiful purple color during the autumn. Now, I mentioned the tree and balancing. It seems like we need something here on this corner. So what I would do is recommend some sort of tree. It could either be against the foundation, not literally against the foundation, but just at the edge here, maybe four to five feet from the corner, or it could be brought out to the street side as a terminus for this hedge. By having it out here, you would use this tree and this tree to frame the front of the house. And what I would do is I would repeat whatever tree this is over here if I planted it in the same plane of the hedge. If I was gonna plant a tree on the corner, I might do something different. I might use a snowball viburnum or maybe one of the dwarf flower and crab apples. Now let's talk about color for just a moment. With these red shutters, I think I might repeat that color here at the front door. And then what I might do is cluster some containers right here. Maybe use this evergreen, leave it in place, but add two other containers. Maybe the container's a beautiful red glazed one. And then the colors that I would use in these window boxes would also echo that color theme. I'd use pinks, burgundies, even some really dark leaf plants like that wonderful sweet potato vine called Blackie. These are just a few suggestions to put the polish on the apple, if you will, on this charming little cottage. Now I want to tell you about a flower that I'm absolutely passionate about and have been for years, well as long as I've been gardening. It's the daylily. Now, I guess it's because they're so easy to grow and they come in such a wide range of colors and heights and bloom times. Now take this particular variety, for instance. This is called Autumn Minaret. And what I like about it is it's the last daylily in my garden to bloom, meaning that it will flower sometimes almost to the first of September, it's so late. And the other great thing about it is its height. I mean, these plants, the stalks here, are seven feet tall. I'm so excited about this plant. I've been using it in my breeding program where I've been taking pollen from one daylily, autumn minaret, and applying it to other daylilies. What I'm interested in doing is producing a daylily that's this tall, but in a soft butter yellow. Okay, so the qualities I'm really looking for here are height, color, late blooming, and one more, fragrance. I've actually used an old variety from the 1930s called Hyperion that has a wonderful slight aroma. So my hope in the next generation of daylilies I produce is that they'll have all the qualities I just listed. 
Now, I'm not the only one who thinks daylilies are addictive. Sybil Sims has a real passion for these beautiful blooms, and during a tour of her flower farm, she showed me some of her favorites. Now, over 35 years of gardening here and raising daylilies, how many different varieties are you growing? Well, I have approximately 1,300 different varieties, and they bloom, uh, they bloom early and mid-season and late. So that it, you have how long of a span of time? Uh, pro approximately three months. And what got you excited about gardening to the point that you would plant 1,300 different varieties of daylilies? It, uh, it was a friend of mine that lives at, at uh, Stuttgart, and she had daylilies, and I visited her, and I just, I just got hooked on daylilies. <laughs> So you saw daylilies growing in a friend's garden. That's right. And that was the inspiration. That, that's all it took. <laughs> I was ready to go. <laughs> now this is, there's a lot of work to do out here. Oh, it's uh, eight hours every, every day. That keeps you in good health. Yes, it sure is. And uh, it's, it just keeps me going. This one old man, he was so sweet. He, he, he was on a cane and he was walking around looking. And uh, he said, who helps you here? And I said, you're looking at her. And he said, I can't believe that. <laughs> so you take care of everything yourself. That's right. How do you help customers make a selection of daylilies, Ms. Sims? Well, I tell them their favorite color, pick out the, the flowers that is their, their color. And then uh, that way they can uh, uh, get a variety of that blends together. So if someone really likes the color purple, mm -hmm. then you would have them find a purple daylily and then and then look for others that would work in the same color family. Yeah, the light lights. And that way they can uh, have a blend of pinks and purple and uh, and even the pale yellows. A lot of people collect figurines and quilts and spoons and all sorts of things and then there are other people who like to collect plants. That's what I tell my daughter. I had rather have a flower than a new dress. <laughs> <laughs> You know, every time I hear her say that, it makes me smile. Another thing that's making me smile just now is the fact that we're really moving along with the house. You can see the forms are in, they're pouring concrete, which is the basis for some of these green components that will be coming up out of the ground very soon. Now that's the big news out here. Oh, there's one other thing. We're starting on the gatehouses, the little pavilions at the entry. I'm really excited about it because the materials we're going to use are gonna make it feel really old, but it'll be brand new, like the stone and the dry stacked walls. The materials we're gonna use in these little pavilions actually come from this area. In fact, I picked the stone out just the other day when I visited a local stone yard. Hey, Butch. Hey, Alan. Good to see you. Sorry I'm running a little late. Good to see you. No problem. I'm here to pick out a little bit of stone and need some help. All right. This is uh, one of them that I had in mind. Gosh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Well, look at this formation on the outer edge. That's, that's interesting. Uh, what I wanted to point out about it, the texture and also the consistent thickness of it. Uh, comes out of the ground, unprocessed, uh, consistent thickness. Right. Now, this marking that, you, that I see on here, this looks like it's almost a fossil. It, yeah, it's a, it's a sedimentary stone. So this formation would have been created a million years ago. Yeah, or more, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, gosh, it's really good looking. So Butch, is this stone, this, this piece we have here, essentially the same as, as these larger ones here on the pallet? Uh, they're quite similar, uh, just different texture. Uh, and these are larger pieces. These come out in larger pieces. So you're thinking this larger scale is probably going to be better for those little buildings. I, th I think this will fit your buildings better. Right. The size of it. Yeah. Now, the, the, tell me about the origin of these stones. About how far away did they come from? Uh, both are within 80, 90 miles. The quarries are fairly close together. Yeah, so it's a, so it's a basically an indigenous stone. Yes. And I see a lot of iron oxide, I guess it's iron oxide, on the face of some of these stones. Others don't have it. We're going to paint the buildings. Do you think that'll come through at all? I, I don't think it'll be a problem. If anything, it'll probably enhance it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, give it a nice sort of old world patina. I have to say, as a designer, I get really excited about stone because you can create so many different moods and effects with it. 
Exactly. But now this is just one that I want to show you. Let's go look at some more. Okay, great. Isn't this one of the stones that we used in a garden several years ago? Yes, it is. That's the Pennsylvania blue stone. Uh, it's a very big seller here. Right. We used that at the Worthens for the back garden. Exactly. And we had the ge geometric pattern. Then we put that little tool in the center. Right. Exactly. It turned out beautifully. It well. yeah. Now, Butch, this is a good looking stone here. Yeah, it's funny you should say that, Alan. Uh, this is the same stone that we've been looking at, just processed a different way. Really? So the one we just saw, this is, uh, it, it looks softer. Yeah, it's been run through a tumbling process. The stones tumble against themselves and around the edges and uh, uh, actually knock some of the color off the faces also. It changes so, the appearance. Yeah, so it, so it looks more like a gathered field stone rather than a quarried stone. Exactly. Yeah, and as you mentioned, the, that, the, that reddish color is now off this. Okay, now Butch, I'm seeing a stone over here that's similar in color, but the shape is very regular. Right, and again, that is the same stone processed in a different way. We processed it into four inch strips. Okay. Uh, designed to expose the split face as it's installed. So you can actually see the stratification right. from the sedimentary process. Exactly, and colors. Interesting. Yeah. Well, how do you get the shape so regular and perfect? Okay, we have uh, hydraulic cutters that, that, that chop these up into any shape we want. Actually, these have been run through the hydraulic cutter to shape also. To give them a more geometric form yeah. and, and then you size, them. Yeah, and size that you need for the jobs. You know, what I like so much about stone is that it is natural and thereby fits very comfortably in the landscape. Exactly. And by the way, I've got another stone that I want to show you down here okay. for your project. Sure, let's take a look. Okay, Alan, here's a nice gray stone I want you to look at simply for the color. Well, that is beautiful. It is a, a nice, cool gray. Now, I, this looks familiar. We've used this before on a project, I think, haven't we? Over to, I think, the Trinity Church. Oh, right, right, absolutely. Yeah, we used it as a wall stone. Right. You know, Butch, I like the shape of these blocks. I mean, they're really, really good looking. They'll stack up nicely. I'm, I'm just thinking, though, that that tan stone that uh, had the tumbled edge might be the better choice, particularly since we're gonna paint it. What do you think? Uh, I think you're the boss, Alan. We'll write up the order for the brown and we'll get it done. That sounds great. You know, being green is all about conserving resources. And what we're doing here with the stone that we've chosen, whether it's for the entry pavilions or for the stone walls, is using a local stone. We're not trucking it all the way across the country, so we're not burning up those fossil fuels to get them here. Now, let's talk about money as a resource. I love to save money. You love to save money, I bet. Whether you have a big garden or a small garden, you can save money by choosing plants at the right time of year. Now, I know this doesn't look like much, but this is an on-sale plant at the end of the season. I love to go to nurseries in the late summer and early fall and see what bargains I can find. What I found here is a Russian sage. It's a perennial, so it's gonna come back year after year. When you design your garden, think about integrating lots of shrubs and perennials with pockets for annuals. Nobody wants a garden that's full of annuals that you have to plant over and over year after year. So what I've done here with this Russian sage is I found a dozen of them, and well, they look a little thin and straggly, but I'm just gonna cut them off at halfway, like this, and they'll flush with lots of new growth. Now what I love about this particular perennial is that it's gray, so the color blends with anything. It has a beautiful lavender flower, and its form is great as well. It's light and ethereal. You can see through it to other plants beyond. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I'm sure glad you checked in with us to see how the project's coming along. It's really exciting to see something come together, isn't it? Well, I better get back to work here. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith.